Welcome to this edition of Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Clarkson. Thank you for joining us. We're doing some teaching right now out of the New Testament on the concept of mystery. I call this uh, really sweep of the mysteries, everybody loves a mystery. I think everybody is intrigued by mystery. It's a wonderful uh, you know, thing for our mind to try to solve a riddle, to, to figure a puzzle out. The word mystery appears in a special way in the New Testament, and that's what we are focusing on. In the New Testament, is, it is almost always connected to things that, even if they're already present before our eyes, are going to climax at the end time and at the return of Christ. So these mysteries are very relevant to the future prophecies that still wait to be fulfilled. In uh, things going on, stories, mystery of such on earth, uh, it's kind of a who done it. We're asking you know, who did this crime, bring in CSI, bring in forensic lab, we're trying to you know, do a criminal profile and find the sub. All those things are intriguing. We don't need to do that with the mysteries of the New Testament. We know absolutely who's responsible. God himself is behind every one of these mysteries. And we're going to see as we go through uh, these mysteries more clearly, almost with every passing one, that uh, the purpose of using that word is it's, it's something we can know now. We can solve the mystery because it's been revealed and disclosed. But what made it a mystery until the New Testament time was that it had not formally been revealed to the generations past. In other words, you could read from Genesis through Malachi, be a good uh, observant Jew, uh, trying to follow the Lord in, in the way he revealed in the Old Testament, and you would never know the full mysteries that were going to be exposed in the New Testament when it's mentioned as a mystery. So just to give you some example of, of one we've covered and some we're going to look at, there's the mystery of Israel's blindness. You would have read the Old Testament and never perhaps known that God was going to actually deflect Israel for a little bit, not set them aside in a permanent way, but actually usher in uh, the gospel universally and the church coming forward. You, you, you wouldn't have really known that just reading the Old Testament. And yet in the New Testament, it's clearly described as the mystery of the church, the uh, Jew and Gentile together as one man in Christ. Uh, the mystery of Israel being blind, the fact that Israel uh, blindness in part has happened to them until the time of the Gentiles was fulfilled. You wouldn't have really known that from the Old Testament in its fullness. The idea that God would be manifest in the flesh, the mystery of the faith or the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3. You, you wouldn't have known that completely from the Old Testament. Uh, these are things we're going to get to. The one we're going to talk today about today is very exciting. It's the mystery of the resurrection. And uh, you would have had an inkling of that in the Old Testament. I can point you to like Job chapter 17 where Job says, I know that in the latter days I will stand and see my Redeemer in my flesh. And so you would have realized there is going to be a resurrection. Or Psalm uh, 16 verses 8 to 11 where David says that uh, the Lord will not let him suffer corruption but that you know he will stand again in the presence of the lord or clearly daniel chapter 12 which was definitely a book about the end time and the jews understood that it it ends with the angel saying to daniel that uh, you as for you you will live out your days and then you will sleep in the dust of the earth speaking of his body and then at the end time uh, there will be many raised and it says some uh, to everlasting uh, righteousness and some to everlasting shame so you would have kind of known that, but what you would not have realized, when was this going to unfold and what would happen to the final generation? What would happen to that last living generation when the time for bodily resurrection came? Well, that's why today we want to talk about the mystery of resurrection. And I want you to find in your Bible, if you have it, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as we go to 1 Corinthians 15, this is a good time to just let the word of God Show us what this mystery is all about. So you listen for the word mystery even as we read these verses. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 through 57. Scripture says, and Paul is speaking of course to the Corinthian believers and to all believers ever since because this is the word of God. Now this I say brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. All right, there's the mystery. We will not all sleep, the sleep of death, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, 
For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And then almost quoting Hosea, almost in a tone of mockery, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It's almost as if they're saying, you're not such a big bad boy after all. The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only reason death was defeated is because Jesus has come and vanquished it. He has conquered death and brought life and immortality to light. And we share this through the gospel. What a glorious, glorious thing. Now, the mystery of this is obviously the fact that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The we there, Paul is speaking to the community of believers. He's not referring to the lost. Now, let me say as an aside, they too will be resurrected. Daniel 12 already had spoken in verse 3 of those that are raised to everlasting shame. Jesus in John 5 talks about, I preached this one time on an Easter Sunday. We had a house full of people and I know they weren't all saved. And Jesus talked about the resurrection of the damned. I mean, that was what it says in John 5, that they are raised to be condemned and judged. And I mean, just to give that warning. So the question is not, uh, are you going to live forever? Yeah, the question is, where are you going to live forever? Now, we can be more sophisticated with that and say that, yeah, uh, hell is the second death, and it's truly not living. But uh, the point is, you will exist forever. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Whether you know the Lord or not, you're going to be resurrected, according to Revelation. 1 Corinthians here is talking to believers when it says we. And we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Let's deal with that idea of sleep for a moment. It's led to a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, wrong beliefs and false doctrines. And cults often grab hold of that concept. Uh, A a lot of groups will will, uh, teach and tell you that when you die, you go into a state of soul sleep. That is, you're just out. You're just kind of, you know, zoned out. And you're not conscious until the Lord comes back and raises your body. The only problem with that is it contradicts other passages in the Bible. For instance, in Philippians chapter 1, Paul says to to, uh, live is Christ, but to die is gain. He says to be with Christ, to depart and be with Christ is far better than remaining on this earth. Again, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, Paul says that for the believer to be absent from the body, and that's the moment it happens, to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. So this whole idea of sleep is not talking about your conscious existence, your personality. Uh, David said in Psalm 16, and again, he's referring to the resurrection, that, you know, my, my, uh, my, I'm always before the Lord, and, and, and I've set him at my right hand, and in his presence there's fullness of joy. So we are always before the Lord. What sleeps is the metaphor of the body. And just as the body, if you bury it in normal ways, Many people today are choosing cremation, but if you bury the body, uh, it's laid, uh, you know, it's laid out horizontally, either in a casket or in in some way it's put to a state of rest. And even as they put you in the box, you know, your eyes are closed, your your hands are usually folded either across your chest or down lower, and it's a picture almost of a person sleeping. Well, the Bible uses the word sleep to describe physical death for the Christian, Because death is not to scare us, all right? We're not to be scared to death, nor scared of death. When death comes to the believer, think of a man that has been out mowing his lawn. It's 104 degrees. He is uh, just wiped out and zapped. He's just sweat profusely. He comes in. It's been a blazing afternoon. And he just comes into his uh, living room, and the air conditioning is on. He gets a big glass of iced tea. He puts on his favorite sports game. Sets the tea by his big uh, lazy boy chair and he reclines back. And it may not have been on his goal chart, but I promise you within 10 minutes, that guy's asleep. He's having a nap. His body is in a recovery mode. There's nothing scary or frightening about that. 
And to the believer, the sleep of death is the idea that our body, though dust will go to dust and ashes to ashes, the Lord knows where the DNA is. The Lord probably has it on his own file, but he can collect the DNA sample of you from wherever it would be on this earth. If you were cremated and put to ashes, if you over time naturally just ashes return to ashes, if you were if you were to be lost at sea or consumed even by wild beasts or uh, animals, uh, the Lord is able to, to trick your DNA. And so he will be able to raise you perfectly uh, with a body that doesn't have the taint of sin. So this idea of sleep is just a picture of relax and restoration. It's not to be feared at all by the believer. Our Lord has crossed that deep river through that dark night and has come back to take us by the hand and lead us through. And he'll do that for you i tell you we don't need to be afraid of death so let me just take this again and talk about just a couple of of ideas out of this the necessity of our resurrection i don't know if you've ever thought about that you know if the lord didn't do a resurrection what what a beautiful conclusion to uh, creation and what he is you know uh, what he has set out to prove verse 50 says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god okay So that's saying that your present body could not just as it is come into the spiritual realm, into the presence of God as he is. For one thing, your body and my body is a body of sin. It's got a sin nature. Uh, We're tainted. We have the curse of sin in us as we age and decay now. And if you were to come just as you are into the very presence of God, uh, you your body would probably be consumed It'd probably just you couldn't stand the glory of God. Well, the Lord could have then said, okay, we'll let that body die and we'll get rid of that root of sin there, the flesh. And, and then God could have, you know, I guess it wasn't his choice, but we could have lived as floating disembodied spirits through all eternity. Wouldn't that be fun, huh? I don't think so. Sitting on a cloud, plucking a harp, just uh, being a floating spirit. That's, that's kind of crazy. No, God was not about to let Satan get the best of him in any realm. And listen, the day that Adam sinned, God said, when you eat of that fruit, the day you eat it, the day you eat it, eating, you shall die. That's dying, you shall die. That's literally the the force of the Hebrew verb, dying, you shall die in the day you eat it. And yet you read in your Bible that Adam lived uh, into his 900s of age. So was God wrong on his math? Never, of course not. Adam died instantly when he and his wife took that fruit. It wasn't a chemical reaction to whatever the fruit was. They died instantly in their spirit where they fellowshiped with God in the deepest part of the human being. The spirit died, the lights went out, and they recognized it. Their eyes were opened, but their spirits were darkened. And they instantly recognized the difference. They went and made uh, leaves of figs and clothed themselves and that's because their eyes were open to see that they were in a, in a state of nakedness but more importantly they hid from the lord whom they had loved and known whom they had had fellowship and communion with walking in the garden and so when god came walking in the garden in genesis 3 he called out adam where are you and the lord knew where adam was he was really saying adam do you have any idea where you are now and Adam was hiding with his wife. And he answered, I heard your voice and I was afraid. So the death began instantly. And, and where people have this, this is a kind of a, a negative fear of God where uh, some people can't find God the way some criminals can't find the police when they're in the middle of doing a crime. They're not looking. And, uh, you know, you you have this instinct to go the other direction because of the sin and the guilt. And this is very much a picture. But Adam lived on his soul, that part of him. The Bible says we're we're spirit, soul, and body. His soul lived on. But there was a, a mark of death on it. He suddenly became alienated in his relationships. He and Eve would struggle in their marriage relationship and God would establish in the curse that uh, her desire would be to rule over her husband, the original feminist movement, that she would uh, struggle with that and that that he, uh, in his own way, would have conflict and misunderstanding with his wife. And then they watched as their boys were born and grew up and uh, one murdered the other. So there was this alienation of the soul. 
And our society is full of all kinds of patho pathologies people have because of the effects of sin. And then ultimately the body did die. So sin sold by. So what I'm saying is the necessity of the resurrection is this. The day that you accept Jesus Christ. The first thing that was lost by Adam is the first thing you get back. You are instantly born again. Jesus said that when you receive him. You are born again or born from above as the as the Greek can have both meanings. And so you become spiritually alive to God. And that happens the moment you call on Christ. And at the end of the show, when we give you that opportunity and appeal to give your life to Christ, if you have it, you give your life to Christ, you'll be born again. You'll be spiritually alive for the first time in your life. It's a wonderful thing. And then you begin. That's justification. Then you begin this process of sanctification where you are going to actually uh, over the years as God may grant you time on earth begin to grow and become more like Christ. Now your character's developing your personality and all those pathologies and addictions and all those negative things are getting put out of our system as we walk with the Lord now as this child. And then the last thing that Adam lost his his body is the last thing that we shall recover because after we do die and we are laid in the ground. When the Lord returns, our body is raised. And so there we are. We're given everlasting, immortal, incorruptible existence with a body. God was not about to let Satan win the upper hand and say, okay, I can save him spiritually, but I guess you got the body. God said, no, my salvation is a total salvation. It's not only total, it's better. What we're going to have on the other side of the resurrection is better than what Adam had in the garden. Adam had innocence. We're going to have blamelessness. Adam had an openness to God. We're going to have face-to-face uh, -face existence without interruption. Adam had, uh, you know, the hope to build a future. We're going to have a secured future that can never be lost. So God not only restores, but he goes above and beyond as he restores. That's the necessity of the resurrection. It's a beautiful thing. And then uh, we'll be free from sin's curse at this great resurrection day on our flesh. The whole creation, Romans 8, 18 to 21 says, will be liberated from bondage. And it is groaning right now and waiting, just waiting for the resurrection of the sons of God. And just think we'll live forever in a physical, spiritual state and we'll be like Jesus. Now, that's the necessity of our resurrection. In the few moments left today, let's just think about the nature of that resurrection. That's what Paul brings up in this chapter. People are asking, well, well what's it going to be like? What's, and, and, and Paul even says, well, you fool. I mean, he's kind of upset with them thinking about it. He says, you know, you, you, you plant a seed. What comes up doesn't look like the seed. For instance, I, he didn't mention an acorn, but I will. You plant a little acorn, well, up's going to come an oak tree. And the glory of the full-grown oak tree is so much larger and more magnificent than the little acorn ever was. You wouldn't even connect them except there are acorns hanging all over the branches of the majestic oak tree. Well, our resurrection body is going to be like that. It's going to be so much more spectacular and magnificent and indescribable and incredible than the body we have right now. Now, some of us have bodies that are in different stages of decay. I have a, a son that is 19 that is a bodybuilder. And I mentioned uh, with some fair amount of parental modesty that in his age and uh, weight division he came in second in the nation last summer and uh, I mean he's a specimen he looks like one of those Greek uh, you know statues you see and he's proud of it and the reason he's proud is it's all natural then I have another friend who is uh, sad to say I'm going to visit later today um, he learned that he had cancer and uh, he was a single man, didn't go to the doctor like men do, didn't have a wife to kind of, you know, nudge him into doing that. And his body was telling him he just didn't want to admit it. When he finally went for another problem, this diagnosis came up and the cancer is, is literally perhaps even in his brain and it's in his bones and it's, it's absolutely uh, destroying the shell of his body. Lord willing, I'll go by and see him today he's a dear friend he was saved out of a life of, uh, of real uh, you know fighting and drinking and just just all kinds of things and he's been a beautiful Christian but that body's in far different shape than my son's but when I think about the resurrection 
both of them are, are, are going to be so much more and incredibly beyond what they are even now. It, it's amazing to contemplate. The words for resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, a couple of Greek words, anastasis, that means literally to stand up again. Anna, again, stasis, to stand. Literally, it's almost that we'll stand again because of what Christ has done. The body looks fallen. Death seems to be dancing on our grave. But we will rise up and death itself will die and we will dance on the grave of death. Another word here is a lasso. And it means to transform or to alter. Speaks of terms like imperishable, immortal, and victory. And Paul explains this in the earlier verses 37 to 41 saying that there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another of the stars. There's different variations of glory. And I rather think that uh, we're going to be in, in, in this state much like Jesus. You know, you watch today the process of age and decay. As I mentioned, my friend, you see cancer waste away someone's body. And doctors even say that's just not natural. They're at a loss somewhat to explain all the dynamics of aging and why it occurs because we were truly designed uh, to live forever. And yet we know biblically sin is the reason. I think about Jesus when he rose. What was his resurrection body like? Well, um, he was in the prime of life. He was 33. I don't have this on hard facts, but I love to believe that uh, the Lord will shine on us. And when he resurrects us, we will be in the prime of our life. Um, and, and I do think he will. He'll, he'll bring us in our prime manhood or womanhood. Uh, Jesus was, was touched. He said, touch me and see. He was physical. And yet he could pass through walls and doors. He hugged and embraced. He even ate broiled fish. He even cooked breakfast one morning on the seashore. So we will be able to, to be much like that in the, in the state of our resurrection. Other things that are answered here, and this is really important. We could do a lot more on this than we have time for. But let me talk about the stages of the resurrection for just a moment. I go back to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 where it's, it's hinted at. It says, now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Okay, that's the Jewish concept of the harvest. The first fruit was the very first stalks that came up. You offered it and gave it to God. The rest would come. The first fruits promised there would be a further harvest. And after that main bulk of harvest was brought in, then there was the after harvest known as the gleanings. We can take those three phases or stages of harvest time and relate it to the resurrection because Paul brought it up to us right here when he called Jesus the first fruits. Christ rose the first fruits from the dead. And certainly he is unique and uniquely offered and given to God and totally the Lord's even as those first fruits were returned as a tithe to the Lord. So that's Jesus. He's the first fruits. But then there's that major harvest. And that I believe is referring to all the saints who will be raptured and resurrected in that final generation. I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So the dead in Christ will rise, 1 Thessalonians 4. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And this is the, the, the main harvest itself, the rapture and resurrection of the saints. And then there's going to be the gleanings, which are actually mentioned in Revelation 20. Uh, that refer to that time of uh, after the tribulation has come and then, and then the Lord has come and he has defeated the Antichrist and the beast and Satan and he's thrown them into the bottomless pit. Satan is bound for a thousand years, Revelation chapter 20, and it speaks of the resurrection even of those who had been killed during the tribulation, of those saints who had uh, really come to Christ after the church was lifted and raptured out. They too will need to be resurrected. They have been disembodied spirits. Because we see in Revelation chapter 6. Uh, where where uh, the, the seal. The fifth seal is opened. And he says I saw the souls or spirits of those. Who had been beheaded. Before the throne of God crying out. And so they don't have bodies. They're just they're their souls. And, and they need a resurrection to catch up with everybody else. They're like the gleanings. Kind of the after very last droppings of the harvest the gleanings came at the very end and that's by the way what Ruth was allowed to go get from the fields of Boaz uh, the gleanings and there's going to be that final those last Christians coming in who lived through the tribulation and were probably martyred 
executed for their faith they too will have this and all of this is called in revelation 20 verse 5 and verse 13 the first resurrection the second resurrection is those that are raised to stand before the great white throne and be cast into hell when their name is not found written in the lamb's book of life the steps of the resurrection we've talked about the state and the stages the steps of it would be uh, this final generation much mystery is disclosed when he says we shall not all sleep that wasn't mentioned in the old testament but for it to happen god could have let the whole race die out and then just raised everybody but there's going to be a generation that's alive when he returns and he says we will be changed we will be changed the, the order is the same as first thessalonians 4 the dead will be raised and then we will be changed and that's going to be transformational instantaneous it says in the twinkling of an eye that's faster than the speed of light uh, just a transformation uh, and, and it's 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 almost indescribable in its glory and its beauty and it's only right and just uh, that it be this way because our God is righteous and he is just that he would raise the dead first out of honor to them and then those that are alive just be a split seconds difference it'll all happen so fast we'll just kind of all be amazed I believe as we're going up I can just see the angel standing by the elevator a button going up yeah we are headed home what a day that will be uh, we'll be reunited we'll be together forever with the Lord you know if you don't know the Lord um, you're going to have a resurrection but it's not uh, it's not going to be good the Bible doesn't call it everlasting life. We can call it existence, consciousness, awareness. But it's actually going to be the second death. It's, it's called uh, this idea of perishing. It doesn't mean that you cease to exist as some false groups teach, false doctrine. Because in Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus has said that the sheep are actually raised to everlasting life and the uh, goats to everlasting punishment and it's the same word in Greek the punishment endures as long as the everlasting life but it's to be separated from God it's tragic it's miserable it's dreadful and you can be rescued from that which is the whole reason Jesus came you cannot have to fear death you can dance and laugh in the face of death because Jesus has defeated death he died on the cross, rose from the dead, and he offers you eternal life. Call on his name and be saved. Till then, keep looking up.